That's my uh, grandson. He's one year old when this picture was taken four years ago. And uh, there's his great grandfather, my wife's father. He was 87 years old. I barely knew my grandparents. They died in their 50s, which is when people who were born in the 19th century typically died. But most children born today are going to know one or more of their great grandparents. And that's something new. When my grandson was born, he was born into a world, you can see on this picture, where only a handful of countries that are colored in blue have more than 20% of the population over the age of 65. This is the world we live in today. But when my grandson is 40, the world he's going to live is going to look like this. And that's never happened before. This is one of the reasons it's happening. Since 1840, the life expectancy of a human being on this planet has increased linearly with no signs of slowing down. During the 15 minutes you spend listening to me, your life expectancy is actually going to increase by three minutes. You're welcome. <laughs> Watch what's happened since 1800. On this animation, courtesy of my friends at Gapminder, you can see that over the last two centuries, as public health has improved, medicine has gotten better, the life expectancy there on the y-axis has gone up steadily, and the number of children per fertile woman, which is on the x-axis, has steadily gone down from about five and a half in 1800 until now, when our life expectancy is up in the 70s and 80 in some places, you can see that the average fertile woman has two children. Note that even the African countries are moving in that direction. So the whole world is moving in that direction. And that allows me to say with some confidence that the world has reached peak children. There are two billion children in the world today, and in all probability there will be two billion children in the world in 40 years and 60 years and 80 years from now. But there's another demographic group that isn't leveling off like this. And that's the people like my grandson's great-grandfather. The fastest growing demographic group in the developing world are octogenarians and above. When I was born, there were less than 2 million of them in the United States. Now there are 12 million. And when my grandson is 40, there are going to be 32 million people in the US over the age of 80. Nothing like this has ever happened before in human history. And it has profound consequences, which are best expressed as Petsko's fourth law. That which makes you can also break you. You see, for the last 10,000 years, we have built our civilization assuming there will always be a lot of healthy young people to take care of a very small number of not so healthy older people. Life, in other words, is a Ponzi scheme. We feed in income from the bottom and take it out at the top in terms of health care. But that age pyramid on the left of this slide is rapidly converting into what will be, by the time my grandson is 40, a column in which there'll be as many or maybe even more older people than there will be young people. And the consequences of that are, to put it mildly, staggering. This is one of the main reasons why. Your risk for developing a serious neurologic disorder, like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, diseases for which we have no treatment, your risk goes up exponentially when you reach about the age of 60. It goes up so fast that are you lucky enough to live to be the age of my grandson's great-grandfather, mid to late 80s? One in two of you will have one of those diseases. He died of Alzheimer's disease. Right now, there are five million people with Alzheimer's disease in the United States. If you want to know about Parkinson's, just divide every number by four. By the time my grandson's 40, there'll be 14 million of them. That is the population of the state of Illinois, which, remember, includes Chicago. 
If dementia were a country, right now, there are so many people in the world with dementia, 45 million worldwide, it would be greater than the population of Canada, and by 2050, dementia would be the ninth most populous country in the world. As I said, five million Alzheimer's patients, over a million Parkinson's patients today. By the end of the century, unless something happens, 300 million Alzheimer's patients in the world. And since there are three caregivers for every Alzheimer's patient, that means about a billion people in the world out of 10 billion directly affected by one disease. An epidemic unlike anything we've seen since the bubonic plague. One in seven Alzheimer's patients has no caregivers at all. An indictment against social services in this country. Right now, we're spending $200 billion a year just for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. By the time my grandson is 40, that cost will go up to a trillion dollars a year. The gross domestic product of the United States is only $17 trillion. We cannot spend one seventeenth of our GDP on one disease. That is economically unsustainable. So what I have described is a comet about to hit the Earth, and we know roughly when it will hit. If we knew when a comet would hit the Earth, we would all do exactly what we should do, which is to clamor for something to be done about the comet. So obviously, there must be massive action in dealing with this coming epidemic of neurodegenerative diseases, right? Wrong. Right now, federal spending on Alzheimer's disease is less than a third of the spending on HIV AIDS, and there are 10 times more Alzheimer's patients. This is not to say we're spending too much money on AIDS research. It is to say we are spending only a fraction of what we must spend on research on neurodegenerative diseases. As a result, we lag way behind in finding treatments for these disorders, and we are running out of time. So have I scared the ever-loving daylights out of you? Good. This should scare a saber-toothed tiger. It's why, of all the major causes of death in the Western world, the only one where the death rate has gone up in the last 10 years is Alzheimer's disease. OK, so now that I've told you why I do what I do, and why you should hope I succeed, let me give you a sense of where we are in trying to solve this problem. Tell you a little about some science. 101 years ago, roughly, a young neurologist in Germany named Alois Alzheimer saw a woman who was brought in by her husband because she had become demented. Her name was August Dieter, and she is the first recorded Alzheimer's patient in history. The disease, of course, goes back to thousands of years, but this was the first time it had ever been documented. She was, you won't know it from that picture, 51 years old. She was dead in three years. She had a rare, aggressive, genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, as it turns out. And when Alois Alzheimer autopsied her brain, he noticed a number of things that were striking. One was, it was a lot smaller than it should have been. And it had holes in places that it shouldn't have had them. He also noticed that in the neurons, the nerve cells of her brain, there were terrible things happening. The cells were shrunken, their projections had retracted, and there were clumps of aggregated protein material outside the neuron and clumps of a different aggregated protein material inside the neuron. He called these plaques, he called those tangles. You heard from an earlier speaker today, Dr. Lattman, about proteins. These were proteins that were not doing what they were supposed to do and were where they shouldn't have been. They remained the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. What was going on? Well, in order to function properly, proteins need to fold up properly like an origami bird. If they don't, they can become misfolded. 
All cells in your body have quality control machinery to deal with this, but the quality control machinery, like everything else, wasn't meant to last 80 years. It was meant to last until the end of our reproductive fitness. But now that we're living so long, slowly the aggregated material can build up. And in some cases, it can turn into toxic substances. And they kill the nerve cells. That's the degeneration that occurs during Alzheimer's disease. We understand a little about what causes it. There's still a lot we don't understand. What can be done about it? Well, in order to understand what can be done about it, we have to first realize that people's attention has tended to be turned towards what they can see. And what they can see are these plaques and tangles. So a lot of the effort to treat this disease has focused on finding ways to get rid of the plaques and tangles. But we don't actually know if the plaques and tangles are what's causing the disease or just a symptom of some underlying defect in the cell. Most efforts to cure the disease by focusing on the plaques and tangles have been failures, which is why in my laboratory we've been trying to find the underlying cellular cause. Now to understand that, we need to talk about what the inside of a cell looks like. Many people think that the inside of a cell is just like a dilute solution of material, material sloshing around in a lot of water. Not quite. The inside of a cell is actually exactly as tightly packed as Times Square on New Year's Eve. And in order to understand what that means, just think about trying to find somebody in Times Square on New Year's Eve. You would have to give them a location, meet me underneath the sign, right, or at the corner of X and Y, and then you would have to transport yourself there, and they would have to transport themselves there. And this turns out to be the key to Alzheimer's disease, I think, this understanding of the idea of cellular trafficking. If the inside of the cell is packed like this, then in order to get things to function properly, they must be directed properly and transported to where they need to go. That, like the quality control machinery, wasn't built to run for 80 years. And here's what happens when it starts to wear out. you run into the same problems that Chris Christie ran into when he and his aides decided to punish one of the cities in New Jersey for voting for someone else. You probably all heard about this. He decided to close several lanes of the merge onto the George Washington Bridge. And when he did, traffic on the bridge flowed smoothly, but backed up for five and six hours into New Jersey. Something very much like this, with less political overtones, is what happens as you age. You run into problems with traffic control and traffic backing up. Here's what I'm talking about. Imagine a recycling problem. You take your soda bottle, you toss it in the bin, it gets bagged up in trash bags, and you put it outside. Well, I live in New York City, so it sits there for three weeks. But if you didn't live in New York City, then it would get picked up by a garbage truck and the garbage truck would take it to places. It could take it to the recycling bin, and that's good, or it could take it to the landfill, and that's not so good. And if the landfill overfills, you end up with toxic waste. Well, that's exactly what goes on in every cell of your body, including your nerve cells, and your nerve cells are very sensitive to this. So there's a protein in your nerve cells called APP, and it is the precursor to the plaque material. And what happens is that protein gets recycled. That's its normal fate. And that recycling goes exactly the same way. It gets bagged in trash bags, which are called vesicles. And the little vesicles then go into the recycling bin, which is called the Golgi, which sends them right back to the cell surface. And that is green and good. Sometimes, however, they are directed towards the landfill, which is called the lysosome in the cell. And it turns out that in that pathway, and only the landfill pathway, do you make the plaque material. That's the only place that the processing of this protein to make plaque occurs. Now, normally, as you live, there's a balance between 
these two pathways. But as you age, for reasons we still don't fully understand, it turns out the recycling pathway starts to malfunction. And that recycling garbage truck, which is called the endosome, too often goes to the landfill pathway. We have been working on ways to make truck drivers that will direct the endosome towards the recycling pathway and shift trafficking away from plaque material and back towards where it should be. This is green and good because we don't actually inhibit anything or block anything in the cell. All we're trying to do is restore what you already had. In animal models and cell models of Alzheimer's disease, this approach works surprisingly well. But we're still quite some way from being able to test it out in people. Hopefully, at some point, we'll get to that stage and see whether this might be the answer to the problem the world faces with this disease. I'm hoping that'll happen in the next few years. In the meantime, I don't want to leave you feeling without any recourse, so there are some things you can do to protect yourself somewhat against these diseases. For Parkinson's disease, caffeine is protective. Nobody knows why. So go to Starbucks, have a latte, pay the $50. Avoid head injury. Head trauma can lead to Parkinson's disease. This is part of what Muhammad Ali has been going through and other prize fighters. It's also part of the concussion syndrome you've been reading about. All right, so be careful about that. And it's also probably a good idea not to get bird flu. Bird flu can lead to Parkinson's disease. So for those of you who are planning to get the bird flu, don't do that. Where else could you get helpful little tips like this? As far as Alzheimer's disease is concerned, omega-3 fatty acids are good. They seem to be somewhat protective. So fish is good, except, of course, fish that has mercury, that's bad. So don't do that. No, I don't know which or which. All right? High blood pressure, one of the biggest single risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Stop watching the election coverage. <laughs> You'll live longer. Stay mentally stimulated. There's no doubt that mental stimulation and physical exercise is extremely good for your brain. But you know, hey, you're here at TEDx, so you're covered for today. Okay, after this, you're on your own. But today, you're being mentally stimulated. This is a good thing. Do more of it. And one final thing, all right? Wish me luck. Because, not for my sake, huh? But for the sake of your parents and your grandparents, and your children, and your grandchildren. Thank you.